only six months into a role as Minister for Border Force, and Home Affairs Claire O'Neill. Looks like she's no better than Peter Dutton. O'Neill already seems to be failing Australians, and Australia's immigration system is in need of a serious overhaul. Just this year, the informer broke a story where in 2008, a New South Wales woman allegedly held another woman hostage in Vanuatu until the kidnapped agreed to say they were in a relationship. Well, the woman is now a permanent resident in Australia, and even though the federal government and border force are aware of the allegations, they are yet to act. The story highlights how broken the system is, and that was further reinforced by an aged Sydney Morning Herald and 60 Minutes investigation into human trafficking and abuse. It's a system that has massive holes allowing unscrupulous people to literally do as they please. And joining us to discuss what is a huge concern in a failing system is our political editor, Anka Sahin. Welcome, Anka. Hi, Michael. Now, this stuff just raises some serious questions. And with your expertise as an immigration lawyer, I can't think of anyone better to ask about it. It's um, extremely concerning, to say the least, and some of the um, some of the information, um, the investigation uh, by the AU City Morning Herald and 60 Minutes has uncovered will not come as a surprise to many of us uh, who've been working in this space for, for many years. Um, every now and again, um, there is an investigation of this sort, which brings to the fore once again, um, just how open to abuse, I guess, certain elements of our immigration system is and, and how unscrupulous people, as you said, uh, are somehow able to take advantage of the system with almost complete impunity. Uh, one of the things that this particular investigation uncovered, I think that that's um, a new piece of information that hadn't um, become public before, was about this um, alleged crime boss, uh, this person who has a conviction in um, human trafficking from the United Kingdom, somehow running a similar in, um, operation in Australia uh, with, with nothing being done about it. What's, what I thought, you know, when I first read about it is, is this person an Australian citizen? Because I can't imagine how he would have gained access to Australia and got into Australia on a visa, whether on a temporary or a permanent visa, if he's not already a citizen. I mean, we're talking about a person with a conviction in human trafficking in the United Kingdom and a fairly recent conviction as well. Not that that matters. You have to declare all convictions going back to the beginning of time when you apply for a visa for Australia and something as serious as human trafficking is certainly enough to see you barred from entering this country in most cases mm -hmm. under, under the character provisions. So this person, I, I just cannot understand how they would have gained access to Australia unless they're a citizen. But if they're a citizen, we should know. Uh, that's something that the investigation did not um, uh, did not highlight. Now, you deal with countries all around the world in, in your role as an immigration uh, lawyer. How does Australia compare as far as complexity? And do you think uh, being thorough in their investigations? Um, look, uh, Previously in my career, I worked with uh, visa applications to New Zealand and to Canada as well. Uh, I can say that um, Australia's visa system is by far the most complicated of the three. And I think uh, as far as I understand, you know, as an outsider, I haven't had much uh, to, to do with the UK and US systems, but I think it's a lot more complicated than those systems as well. Just the sheer number of visas that are available, the, the amount of information that you would need to have to even find out what visa is appropriate for a given situation and how to navigate the system. Uh, I think in those respects, Australia's is um, by far the most complicated. In terms of how thorough uh, the, um, the authorities are when they scrutinize applications, um, on paper, Australia's is no, no worse than, than those other countries. 
the certainly the uh, the architecture, the the legal architecture is there to ensure that people with uh, serious criminal convictions and people with um, health conditions that um, may pose it. Uh, a, a threat to public health in Australia are able to be um, screened out of the process uh, when they're when they're applying for visas. So I think those systems are already in place. They should be fairly robust. Um, when you look at this situation, I mean, putting aside this this person with the with the convictions because that part really doesn't make sense as I explained. But putting that to one side, the other allegations in the in the that um, in the investigation, um, one was to do with um, how people were coming into the country, um, basically on uh, electronically obtained tourist visas, and these electronically obtained tourist visas are pretty much, um, in most cases, granted with no human intervention. So they're granted completely electronically and automatically. Um, so certain countries um, that have uh, access, whose passport holders have access to these automatically granted tourist visas are able to come into the country uh, on these visas that are granted with basically no scrutiny. So it's completely dependent on whatever you have declared. And look, at the end of the day, some of these people may have may be completely clean as far as background is concerned. So no health issues, no character issues and so on. But because they have easy access to Australia on the basis of being able to get these electronic and, um, and automated visas, they can come into the country, sign up for a, a low value sort of training course, um, six months, nine months, whatever, and, um, and then basically uh, find themselves a training provider that's not going to be too fussed about whether or not you turn up to, to class. And then use that visa to um, uh, potentially to work um, uh, not, not illegally because they are allowed to work, but work, um, I suppose, you know, in, um, uh, in some sort of exploitative relationship as the investigation uncovered. And that's where, the, uh, that's where some of those uh, people, uh, you know, especially women, and I think they mentioned, uh, especially in the investigation, they mentioned women from South Korea because South Koreans have access to Australia on the basis of these electronically granted uh, automated visas. And, and they were finding themselves in, in uh, situations of uh, abuse and exploitation um, uh, where they were being you know, forced to, um, to, to work for you know, little money and, um, and in, uh, and in um, uh, terrible conditions. Now, we've seen that before. That was one of the complaints about the existing uh, 457 visa where you come into the country and you're tied to one employer so he can exploit you because basically if he sacks you, you're on the next plane out. Does that need to be fixed, do you think, Anka? They made a few changes to the 457. They they got rid of the 457. They replaced it with 482. Um, they... Um, they tried to uh, tighten it up a bit uh, by, you know, making it uh, conditional upon um, uh, the sponsorship side of things, at least conditional upon the uh, employer ticking certain boxes. Um, and also what they've done is they introduced what, what are referred to as caveats for certain occupations. So there were a number of occupations that were, um, being misused. Um, these occupations are still available. So some of these occupations were like project administrators, customer service managers, marketing specialists, uh, some of some technician roles. Uh, these, these roles were um, uh, coming up again and again in investigations like this as, as roles that were, I suppose, broad enough to be nominated when the intention was to have the person working, for example, in an unskilled role, right? So they were calling the person a, a project administrator, but actually they were just working as a cleaner. 
these sorts of things were happening under the old 457 system. So what they did to combat some of that was to uh, introduce certain caveats for these sorts of um, uh, occupations that they considered to be problematic. So they introduced for some of them, they said, you have to have a certain turnover because before you can nominate an occupation like that, or you have to have a certain number of staff already uh, on your books, or um, you have to be paying a, a salary of a certain level. Um, does it solve the problem? Well, it helps. It helps because if you if you're going to nominate an occupation like that, and there's a, a you know there's a base salary requirement of eighty thousand dollars, you might think twice before before going down that route. Uh, although I guess uh, if if you've set it up so that um, you know, like if if you've set it up so that you're going to somehow get that money back from the um, uh, from the person you have sponsored, which, by the way, is completely illegal, mm -hmm. uh, and and if 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 you're found out, you would you would be subject to uh, ser very very serious sanctions. Um, then I guess you might not mind so much. Uh, the other thing they have done uh, is when border force was created, uh, the Australian border force was created, and this was under uh, uh, Home Affairs Minister Peter Dutton. Um, the investigative powers of the department with regard to business sponsors were transferred to Border Force. So it, it was Border Force that carried out investigations into potential abuses um, or sponsorship or breaches of sponsorship obligations by employers that are standard business sponsors. So a few things were done to tighten it up a bit and to make it, um, I guess, more difficult to, um, to, to take advantage of but it didn't solve the problem completely. And, and what this investigation, um, uh, this particular latest investigation has uncovered is, is something that really isn't to do with 457 so much. This is more about uh, exploitation of, um, of, of people coming in on other types of temporary visas um, and applying for protection visas with no basis, for example, uh, or on student visas and working um, uh, in uh, in these sorts of exploitative relationships. Mm. And the number of people coming in illegally through our airports dwarfs what we have coming through boats at any stage, doesn't it? Anchor people overstaying their their visas and so forth. Oh yes, the numbers of people who overstay um, would be would be higher than any any sort of boat arrivals uh, at any point in time. Uh, and, and the other thing, of course, is that I guess uh, not much is done about those those overstayers in most cases because th the numbers are so big that there's no way the department could um, you know uh, find and um, identify and find and detain every single one. Many of them just overstay and at some point they just decide to call it quits and go. Um, but I think the biggest problem, uh, which has been around for a long time, is the, um, is the abuse of the protection visa system. The protection visa system is there to provide protection to people who really, really need it. And there are so many people who, who truly do. Uh, but unscrupulous people, um, and, and then this includes sort of unregistered unregistered uh, operators who um, or community people within certain communities who who are telling people oh well you're here now um, you can apply for a protection visa it doesn't cost very much it doesn't cost very much to apply for a protection visa it's only a few hundred dollars when you compare it with uh, other visas that are thousands of dollars it's, uh, it's it's a drop in the ocean the other thing is when you apply for a protection visa onshore, you get full work rights. So there's you know unlimited work rights on the bridging visa, and the uh, and the processing time is several years, two two to three years. So what you you effectively what what these people are being told is you know, come into the country, apply for a protection visa, uh, you'll have full full work rights. You work a bit and you know eventually you'll get refused and um, after that if you get refused you can take it to the AAT to appeal the appeal takes another three years right you still have your full full work rights during this time and 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 of course the appeal will fail too 
and um, and then you just leave the country. So you've you've got you've got maybe five six years worth of work rights in Australia, out of a bogus, completely baseless and meritless protection visa application. Mm. The department has been aware of this for many many years, and um, uh, and it's it's commonly um, abused, uh, especially by Malaysian passport holders. And why Malaysian passport holders? Because Malaysia is one of those countries that are is able to get um, uh, the automated uh, e-visitor, not e-visitor, but ETAs uh, into Australia. And uh, the vast majority of, in fact, when the department publishes data on protection visa applications, approvals, and uh, sometimes they they single out or they they put to one side applications from Malaysians because more than ninety percent of applications from Malaysians uh, for protection visas have zero merit, mm. and they're only made to so that they can stay in the country longer and work. And this is very very common. And it's it everybody knows about this. Everybody knows that it's mostly Malaysians who do this. You know, I'm not going to mince my, my words. Everyone knows this. Everyone in the industry knows this. The government knows this. And uh, the um, the other thing that came up in the investigation was South Koreans coming in and applying for uh, student visas on shore, and then um, and then and then uh, basically finding themselves in abusive, uh, exploitative relationships with regard to so uh, to to um, to what they were doing in Australia. So my question, or something that I have been saying for a long time is if if it's well known that some of these countries have a history of abusing the um, automated visa approval system for tourist visas why is the why is the government not acting to to withdraw those privileges surely it's it's Australia's sovereign right to determine who gets easy access to Australia and who doesn't why is this why is this being allowed to continue Mm, yeah, Claire O'Neill really needs to look into this, Anchor. Um, one final question before we go. Australia's, mainly Victoria's reputation with regards to our lockdowns, have you seen a drop-off on applications for people wanting to come to Victoria? Have we harmed ourselves? Because it seems very slow on, on the uptake. Um, I don't have any figures relating to to student visas and and the and the like. Uh, in terms of um, in terms of um, interest in permanent applications, uh, it seems to be uh, it seems to be still uh, pretty good. Um, but remember, when it comes to when it comes to state nomination. Um, uh, most of the applicants tend to be people who are already in uh, in in the country and in that particular state who apply. So I suppose um, it's not a good uh, sort of gauge of interest in um, in the state because these are people who have already come into the state who've already made some level of commitment by living here and working here and things like that. And all they're trying to do now is is get get themselves a permanent visa so they can stay permanently. So, um, it, so that's one thing. And the other thing would be who are, um, how many people are now looking to come into Victoria anew who, who have never lived here before. Mm. And I think that's, that's where the interesting figures would lie with regard to what uh, detrimental effect the lockdowns and the travel restrictions may have had, not just on Victoria, but on all the states and, and in Australia, on Australia in general. Great. All right, Anka, we'll have to leave it there. So Anka Sehin, all the way from Turkey, our political uh, reporter. Thanks so much for your time. No worries. Thank you, Michael.